Hello, I'd like to wish everyone a warm welcome to this webinar on NATO solution or problem. My name is Roy Culpepper. I chair the Group of 78. On behalf of the Group of 78, I wish to acknowledge that the Muskoka Lakes, from which I happen to be making these introductory remarks, I'm at a cottage, it's in the traditional territory of the Ojibwe and Chippewa Anishinaabe and the territory of the Mohawk Wata community. The office of the G78 itself is located in the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. We are grateful for the stewardship exercised over these lands for countless generations by indigenous people. In the wake of the recent discoveries of many hundreds of bodies of children in unmarked graves on the sites of residential schools, in locations across Canada, we condemn the systemic racism that led to their tragic deaths. We grieve with Indigenous families and communities and express our solidarity in their search for justice. I'd like to mention that this year, we are marking the 40th anniversary of the statement issued by 78 prominent Canadians to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1981. This statement led to the founding of the Group of 78, which promotes dialogue to advance world peace and disarmament, reduce global inequality, and ensure planetary survival. Over the coming weeks, we are launching some initiatives to help ensure that the G78 continues to help shape a progressive foreign policy for Canada. Today, we are honoured to welcome back Professor Paul Robinson from the University of Ottawa, whom we hosted almost four years ago at a Group of 78 luncheon talk in pre-pandemic times. The subject then, as today, was NATO. Now, much has happened in the intervening period. Donald Trump, no friend of NATO, was defeated in the 2020 presidential election. And his successor, Joe Biden, has clearly indicated that he wants to strengthen NATO to face what he sees as the escalating threat posed by both Russia and China. The path-breaking treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, ratified by 122 countries, has come into force. Regrettably, without Canada's signature, since this would be inconsistent with our membership in NATO, according to the government. I'm also pleased to welcome Robin Collins, who will be our moderator for this webinar. Robin is past chair of the G78's Working Group on Peace and Security. He's currently co-chair of the Canadian Network to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and Secretary of Canadian Pugwash Group, where he has presented on NATO nuclear policy and peacekeeping success and failure. Robin will introduce our distinguished speaker and preside over the Q&A session. I'd like to thank you both, Robin and Paul, for joining us on a warm summer's day. So Robin, over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, divided opinion about NATO is normal. And the virtue of Canada's membership within the alliance is a perennial debate. The great majority within the peace movement and many on the political left support a Canadian exit from the alliance and an end to the alliance. They see NATO as outmoded or dangerous and provocative and a stooge of powerful states. Public opinion, on the other hand, in Canada has persistently been supportive of, con of continued Canadian membership in NATO, and by a wide margin, often 70% or more. Currently, only the left-wing Quebec Solidaire, among mainstream or governing political parties, opposes Canadian membership in NATO. Both the Parti Québécois and NDP at the moment on the left, well, left and nationalist left, at the moment support Canada staying put, although there are subgroups within 
who advocate exit. There's a debate between those who call for reform of NATO from within and those who argue NATO changes Canadian foreign policy in a bad way. This brings us to today's webinar. Professor Paul Robinson is a professor in the Graduate Studies of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. He is the author of numerous works on Russian and Soviet history, military history, military ethics, and defense policy. He writes regularly for the international press and is author of the Irrationality blog. Prior to taking up his academic career, Professor Robinson served as a regular officer in the British Army Intelligence Corps and then as a reservist in the Canadian Forces. After Professor Robinson's presentation on NATO and some of the debates within, we will pose your questions to him. So feel free to post them in the Q&A section, not in the chat section. And um, be, you, you're, you're welcome to include a follow-up question uh, if you wish uh, that we'll attempt to get in if time allows. Uh, over to Professor Robinson. Need to unmute there. I go. Okay. So, so thank you, Robin. Thank you to the group of 78 for inviting me back and, and thank you all for um, attending uh, virtually my presentation here today. I, I, I hope I'll, I'll make it worthwhile for you. In the modern world, there are um, multiple problems which individual states can't deal with individually and which require, you might say, a collective uh, solution. And I think it's therefore natural and, and, and obvious that states which have some sort of political affinity will bind together in multinational institutions to deal with these problems. Uh, and, you know, one such problem, of course, is that of international security. And therefore, it is, is I think, almost inevitable that leaders of, of Western states um, will demand the existence of some sort of um, Western um, institution, um, which is multinational and can lead to um, collective action on security issues. So that even if you were to, um, say, get rid of NATO, you know, something like NATO would take its place in, in, in the sense that, it, you know, the leaders of Western states are, are going to look for uh, such, a thing, such a being. Um, having said that, although we might say that something like NATO um, is probably inevitable. That doesn't mean that we should um, take the existing form this international institution takes as a given and consider it to be immune from criticism. Um, in fact, it, it's never healthy for any institution or any idea or any policy to go unchallenged. It leads to uh, intellectual atrophy, which in turn leads to, to bad policy. So, so we do need to challenge more. And therefore, that's what I, I plan to do today, asking whether NATO is really a solution to international problems or whether it is itself part of the problem. Now, going back to what was said in the introduction about whether you reform NATO or get rid of NATO, that's kind of a, um, a different issue. Um, but you can't even begin to talk about that until you first agree there's a problem, right? So, so we need first to, to, to think about that and, and ask, does NATO actually make the world a better place, or is it the case, as one British scholar says, that NATO exists to solve the problems created by its own existence? Now, there are, there are a few ways of answering this question. One is theoretical in the sense that it rests on abstract arguments about the benefits that NATO theoretically brings. And I say abstract because many of these advantages can't be measured. No, we're told, for instance, that NATO helps deter Russia from attacking Europe. But is that true? I mean, does Russia really have any intention of attacking Europe in the first place? I mean, some people might say yes, but others would say no. And if his answer is no, then there's no deterrence. But ultimately, we can't resolve the question because it kind of relies on a counterfactual. Right? I mean, because we don't know what would happen if there was no NATO, and therefore we can't prove this. So any argument ends up being ultimately a theoretical one. Right? So another way of answering the question is by looking at the actual things that NATO has done and then measuring their impact. 
And this method has the advantage of resting on, on verifiable data. So this is how I'm, I plan to start off, although inevitably there will be certain drift into to sort of theoretical um, arguments as, as, as I go along. Um, and I think, you know, a good place to start in terms of what NATO has done would be Afghanistan because it's in the news at the moment. So I'm going to talk a lot about um, Afghanistan, where fighting is taking place across the country. And just over the weekend, um, the Taliban captured six provincial capitals. Um, in addition to the six they've captured, uh, Taliban forces are on the outskirts of Kandahar, which the Canadian army defended for several years. And they are reported to have captured nine tenths of the city of Lashkar Gah, which is the capital of Helmand province, which was for some years the responsibility of, of the British army. Now, I mention this because Afghanistan was for a long time the focus of NATO's largest ever overseas deployment. It was a test of the alliance's ability to bring order not just to the North Atlantic area, but to the world more generally. So it is a good sort of testing ground, therefore, of what impact NATO has actually had in practice and whether it lives up to the claims of its supporters. And unfortunately, the, when we look at the outcomes, um, it's not a very pretty picture. And it's worth noting here that NATO in Afghanistan has performed even worse than the Soviets did. Uh, after the Soviet Union left Afghanistan in 1989, the Mujahideen launched an immediate offensive in order to capture major cities. It failed dismally. Okay? The uh, Soviet supported government actually held on to all the major cities after the Soviets left. It was only when the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991 and the supply of money to Afghanistan dried up that the Mujahideen managed to capture any major population centers. So the fact that the Taliban have succeeded in doing what the Mujahideen failed to do, despite the fact that they don't have a superpower supporting them in the way that the Mujahideen did, is a proof of the total failure of NATO's efforts to build a stable government in that country. But the negative assessment of NATO's performance in Afghanistan lies in more than just its poor results. For there's good reason to consider that it was precisely NATO's presence in the country that helped the Taliban recover after their defeat at the hands of the Americans in 2001. So it's not just that NATO failed to defeat the Taliban or to create a strong Afghan government, it's that NATO actively contributed to resurrecting the Taliban. One can see this by, um, for instance, reference to Helmand province, which was from 2006 under the control of the British Army. Until the arrival of NATO forces that year, uh, the province was lawless in the sense that it lacked much by way of central government authority. At the same time, though, it was peaceful. Foreign aid workers were able to operate freely there without fear of being attacked. The moment NATO arrived in the form of the British Army, the situation changed immediately, and Helmand province became a center of massive violence as Taliban forces honed in on the British. In short, NATO's presence inflamed the situation. And it didn't help that NATO was supporting some thoroughly unpleasant types and was, in effect, being exploited by particip participants in local power struggles as a means of defeating their opponents. So we have this sort of image in our eyes that you know, NATO was supporting the central government against the Taliban. The reality on the ground was that um, local power was being contested between different groups of um, locals who largely you know, had their fingers in all sorts of um, you know, drug running and other pies. Okay, And what we were, in effect, doing was supporting one set of drug runners against another. Um, that's a slight simplification, but you, you, I say that to give a general sense of what actually happened. So Canadian General Rick Hillier liked to say that NATO's enemy was scum, but what he didn't mention was that in the eyes of the locals, NATO's friends were even scummier. So let's go back to Helmand, uh, where the Brits were in the town of Sangin, where uh, the NATO forces in the form of the British took up base. And this is what one British participant, Stephen Gray, um, said about what actually happened. Um, he said, the chief of Hellman's secret police, Dado, had turned Sangan into his private fiefdom. Dado had started a private jail, was always drunk or stoned, had raped boys and women, and was systematically stealing from the population. As far as most were concerned, the British were there to pop up Dado and his cronies. Many of the fighters were locals. <laughs> 
Okay. And another British officer, Frank Ledwidge, um, described the situation as follows. Dado was one of a large network of drug warlords, exactly the sort of individuals that the Taliban had removed. Now the British were, being, were seen to be supporting these criminals' return. So in essence, uh, NATO, in the form of the British Army, was drawn into a local drug turf war in the process of which they so antagonized the locals but many of them who'd been previously minding their own business joined the Taliban and took up arms. And this wasn't just true of the British in Helmand. You see a similar dynamic in uh, Kandahar province when NATO forces in the form of the Canadian army arrived. And their arrival permitted the return of criminal elements who'd been driven from the area by the Taliban some time before. So um, an example was a notorious drug running commander, the Spin Boldak border region, Abdul Razik, um, who, according to um, Matthew Akins, Canadian reporter, responded to the unexpected resistance with brutality. They were killing women and children, said Ustaz Halim, a former Mujahideen, former Mujahideen commander who lives in Kandahar. After that, everyone was with the Taliban. And reviewing the situation, Akins remarks that a grim irony of the rising pro-Taliban sentiments in the South is that the United States and its allies often return to power the same forces responsible for the worst period in Southerners' memory. By installing these characters and then protecting them by force of arms, NATO has come to be associated in the minds of many Afghans with their criminality and abuses. NATO's presence in Afghanistan led to a massive flow of money into the country. Now, when you pour billions and billions and billions of dollars into an impoverished state, the result is corruption on a huge scale which both undermined the legitimacy of the Afghan government and filled the coffees of the Taliban. Um, because a significant percentage of the money and supplies given to Afghanistan by NATO powers percolated down um, into the hands of the Taliban. So uh, John Sopko, who is the uh, US Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction and responsible for auditing all the money which the Americans spend in Afghanistan, um, came to the University of Ottawa a couple of years ago, and he told us, that, and I'll quote his exact words here, the end of the US supply chain in Afghanistan is the Taliban. Yeah. Um, so if you want to know where the Taliban got its money and weapons, indirectly they got them from NATO powers. In short, if you add all this up, then you see that NATO was never a solution to Afghanistan's problems. It was, unfortunately, um, a large part of those problems. And this is true elsewhere. Take, for instance, the other main country in which NATO has operated in recent years, which is Libya. As you no doubt recall, NATO bombed Libya in 2011, notionally in order to prevent a humanitarian crisis, but in reality, in order to overthrow the government of Colonel Gaddafi. Now, putting aside the reasons uh, for the operation, the results once again were very negative. Um, the first negative result was a war, but Gaddafi was about to win and would have been over in a week, probably dragged on for another six months, okay, resulting in almost certainly many more deaths than would otherwise have been the case. Along the way, the city of Tawerga was ethnically cleansed of its 30,000 or so African uh, population by the rebel forces. So the guys we were supporting ethnically cleansed this largely um, sub-Saharan African city. Um, and NATO, which justified its missions on humanitarian grounds, didn't lift a finger. Um, in the aftermath of the war, large amounts of weapons fell into the hands of radical groups who then exported revolution south into sub-Saharan Africa, sparking a civil war in Mali, which continues to this day and in which Al-Qaeda has succeeded in obtaining control of a substantial amount of territory. Civil war has also spread from Libya into Chad, whose president was recently killed by rebels coming out of Libya. Weapons from Libya were also funneled into Syria, arming Al-Qaeda and other radical groups there. As for Libya itself, it remains divided with two competing governments and a low intensity civil war, which remains ongoing and shows no sign of being settled. In short, in every respect, NATO's intervention in Libya has turned out to be just as much a disaster as its operation in Afghanistan. So it's a pretty bad record. Two major operations, both failed dismally. Um, both had very negative results. Um, in addition to that, NATO expansion into Eastern Europe, along with other NATO actions, most notably the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, has served to worsen tensions with the Russian Federation and led to an almost complete rupture in Russian-Western relations. Now, 
NATO defenders argue that the Russians are largely to blame for this, and that I certainly don't want to give the impression that NATO is, is the root of all evil and that others don't have a responsibility for things that have gone wrong. And clearly, the Russians have, have played, their, um, played their part in all of this. And that's, that's very clear. Um, but as someone who studies Russia, it's clear to me that over the past 20 years, Russians' trust in NATO has collapsed. Whereas once they hoped for a genuine partnership, they now almost universally view NATO as a hostile and aggressive force. NATO statements to the country are just not believed. You know, and it doesn't matter how much NATO says, you know, we're a peaceful, a defensive institution, like nobody in Russia believes it. Whether they're right or wrong to feel that way is, is kind of actually neither here nor there. They may be entirely wrong to think that way. But the fact is that that is how they feel. So the actions of NATO members, both collectively through NATO itself, but also individually outside of NATO, have utterly destroyed its credibility and created an impression among the overwhelming mass of the Russian population that Russia is under attack. And this impression induces Russians to feel that they must counterattack, thereby putting NATO countries, including our own, um, at risk. So let's, let's look at it from a, a Russian perspective. Um, 13 years ago this month, on the 8th of August 2008, Georgia launched an attack on the breakaway province of San Facetia, in the process of which it killed a number of Russian peacekeeping troops. Russia then responded with a counterattack that utterly destroyed the Georgian army. Now, why did Georgia attack? From a Russian perspective, the answer is clear, because NATO had promised Georgia eventual membership. And this emboldened the Georgians to think that NATO had its back and that Russia wouldn't dare respond if it attacked South Ossetia. In other words, from a Russian perspective, NATO must share a, a large part of the responsibility for what happened. Now, I'm not saying the Russians are right to think that, but that is what they do think. Okay? And it informs the way they behave, which is ways we often don't like. And in that sense, um, our own behavior, you might say, induces a counter behavior, which then puts us um, um, at risk. So uh, we end up um, perhaps inadvertently um, making our own position worse. So let's take another example. After the outbreak of civil war in Ukraine in 2014, NATO troops, um, NATO decided to send additional troops to the Baltic states, notionally to deter a, a Russian attack. Among those additional troops is a Canadian uh, battle group, which is in Latvia. Now, let's consider this. Um, Latvia, where Canadians are, is 6,400 kilometers from Ottawa. Right. It's precisely zero kilometers from Russia because it's right next door. Canadian troops in Latvia are 300 kilometers or so from Russia's second largest city, St. Petersburg. The nearest Russian troops to Ottawa are 6,000 kilometers away. So we traveled 6,000 kilometers to be on their border. They have not traveled 6,000 kilometers to be on our border. So from their point of view, who's threatening who? The answer, it seems to me, um, is fairly obvious. Now, if one therefore looks not at abstract theory, but at NATO's actual actions, one sees a succession of decidedly negative outcomes, um, which leads me to have a reluctant conclusion as, as someone um, who's a former army officer and, and served in NATO forces. But unfortunately, um, you know, in, in recent years, NATO has not been helping to make the world a more stable or, or better place. In fact, it has contributed to the problems of international instability. Its failures, however, do not seem to produce much by way of reflection, let alone a reduction in ambition. In fact, NATO seems to be determined to spread its rings far beyond the North Atlantic. At their summit meeting in June, NATO leaders issued a communique saying that the alliance needed to respond to the growing threat of China. Other countries listed as threats to the North Atlantic security community included North Korea, Iran, and Syria. Now think about this for a moment. China, North Korea, Iran, Syria. What have any of them to do with the North Atlantic? And thus with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, so what we're seeing is, is some sort of effort to turn NATO into a sort of no longer North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but a global security outfit. And in my view, this is uh, potentially quite dangerous 
um, not just to the world, but also to, to our own security interests. Um, we have no interest in a military confrontation with China, nor with North Korea or Iran or Syria. Okay? As far as I can see, there is nothing in such a conflict which could possibly serve Canadian interests or, or Western interests in general. Uh, in particular, I think efforts to militarize relationship with China are fraught with a lot of long-term danger. Um, now, of course, at this point, I realize I'm bidding to move away from um, historical fact and into um, that theoretical abstract I was talking about. So, so I'll, I'll leave things there. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say NATO is all bad, but it's the source of all evil um, or anything like that. Maybe it, it, it is good for something, but it, but in and as I said before, if you didn't have NATO, you know, Western leaders would create something like it. Um, but that doesn't mean we should let it do what it does without criticism. Um, and unfortunately, all too often in recent years, it has acted in ways that have made things worse, not better. So in answer to the question posed in the presentation title, I must conclude that sadly, uh, NATO is indeed um, part of the problem. And uh, thank you for your attention at that point. Um, I'll be happy now to take your questions. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I have a number of questions that I'll uh, go into um, if um, we don't have a few more. I have one question uh, from Manfred. I'm going to um, I'm going to work his question into uh, one of the questions I had. Um, Manfred is asking um, uh, you the term Western states that you began with, <clears throat> and um, as he asks, uh, the term Western state begs the question of how you define that, uh, what Western nations are and whether they do indeed face a credible threat to their security. Um, so he, he would like you to, uh, to clarify what you meant by Western nations. I, I'm going to uh, feed, feed that question a little bit um, uh, with this. Um, if, um, the three uh, prominent NATO actions uh, that most people think of are Afghanistan, Libya, and Kosovo, the last being so-called uh, illegal but legitimate, um, all being problematic. Um, what, what would you suggest would be a, a substitute entity for, for the current NATO members, um, which are generally defined as Western states, let's say, not, not all so, not all of them being so. Um, there are 30 members of NATO, half of them were former Soviet uh, linked in the Soviet orbit, and there's 20 partner states within NATO, um, including Russia, as a matter of fact. Um, so, so, so the two the twofold question here is how do you define Western states, and considering the failures of NATO, what what would comfort this, the the current NATO members uh, and the West? Um, I mean, the first one's a very difficult question because you know the West is is a it's a very amorphous concept, right? Um, there is no such thing in a sort of philosophical sense. Um, it is a, an, um, an imagined community, right? Um, which means whatever the person who says, uses the word, wants it to mean to a certain degree. Um, so this is, a, this is an idea of the world which exists in, 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 in our brain and is endlessly changeable, um, one might say. Um, the problem um, with the Cold War and what's happened since is that it's actually um, turned this, what was sort of a, an amorphous idea into a set of institutions, right? So um, there's on the one hand, the idea of the West, which is associated with, you know, values and history and you know, Western civilization coming from the Greeks and the Romans and, all, and Christianity and, and all those things, okay? It's sort of, so a sort of cultural concept. And the Cold War turned it from a sort of cultural concept into an institutional concept. Okay, which took two forms mainly. The first is NATO, and the second is the uh, European Union, right? Um, and um, what happened in the um, 
Cold War then is you had um, the West becoming institutionalized against um, the communist bloc, the Warsaw Pact. Now, the Warsaw Pact then collapsed, um, and with that, you know, this dichotomy of the West against the East sort of collapsed too, um, except that one that happened is that um, NATO expanded eastwards and, and absorbed um, many states which formerly been in, in the Warsaw Pact, but did not absorb Russia, and I think basically is probably institutionally incapable of absorbing Russia, and, and I don't think Russia in any case would want to be absorbed. Um, so this the, the very existence of these institutions, NATO in the EU, has created a um, permanent issue between Russia and what we call the West, right? Um, so previously, Russia could be part of the West because there was no institution called the West, and so it could feel culturally part of it, and it could be part of the Council, the, the Concert of Europe and, 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 and all the rest of it, and, and its royal family would marry with our royal family and so on and so forth, and, and it would be in some, in some meaningful way part of this Western world, even if not entirely. But the continuation of NATO um, and also um, the expansion of the EU has created a war, institutional war between Russia and the West, um, which threatens to permanently cut Russia off from us and institutionalize conflict. Okay, so that, that is, that is a, 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 a criticism I have of um, NATO expansion and, and continued and NATO's continued existence, and that also to some degree of the EU, actually. Um, that's maybe not a perfect answer to your question, but it's probably the best I, I can do, because um, as, as I think the question was implying, this whole idea of the West is a little vague. Um, but the problem is it's been institutionalized. That's what I'd say. As for what, um, you know, what could replace NATO, um, it's not, I'd have to say, an issue on which I've devoted a huge amount of thought, and I think it requires a huge amount of thought, because it's a very, very difficult question. Um, my main issue with NATO is the, um, the way, uh, the excessive militarization of international security policy, and the, the manner in which it leads to a tendency to seek military solutions. Because NATO has such overwhelming military power Right. that it has a, a very easy temptation to use this. I think something like 70% of the world's defense expenditure is NATO's, right? Um, so, you know, um, the temptation to use military power is very great, but military power is a very bad tool for most um, security problems, okay? It, it um, you know, as a former soldier, I'm not saying there's any use for military power, um, but generally, it's useful for when someone attacks you, and it, it's a matter of your life and death, right? Um, and it's good for blowing things up. But the idea of military power is good for um, peace building uh, and um, spreading democracy and all these things, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a myth and a misunderstanding of what military power can do. But because we have this large military institution, we are tempted towards military solutions. So um, I, I, what I really... One is whether it's NATO or some post-NATO, it really needs to, to, to um, demilitarize to a large degree. Um, so, um, you know, um, that's the direction in which, which I would want to move. Now, whether NATO is institutionally capable of that, I don't know, because NATO is fundamentally a military alliance. Okay, and all the other stuff is just kind of like extra baggage. Um, that's why possibly something other than NATO would be better, something which is not fundamentally founded on military, um, a better uh, form of institution. Thank you. Um, we're, we're getting a whole slew of questions in now. Very good. Um, let me go to uh, Richard Denton's question. Uh, I think a fundamental question about the nature of NATO. Is NATO controlled by the United States? Or does it reflect collective European states and uh, Canadian uh, input? Um, I, I wouldn't say it was controlled by the United States because you know um, uh, individual members have individual wills and, and they don't always do um, what the Americans want. Um, and we see this outside of NATO um, when, for instance, say the Germans have, have um, 
resisted the Americans successfully um, about the construction of the North, North Stream 2 pipeline to, to, um, uh, to Russia, linking Russia and Germany. Um, so, so NATO states are not total vassals of, of the United States. Um, however, it is obviously the case that the United States, um, which contributes having sort of two thirds of NATO's military expenditure, um, is going to have the dominant voice within the alliance. Right. And that um, states uh, within NATO um, will be able to shape it a little bit here and there, you know. Um, but obviously, America is, is number one. However, we saw, for instance, um, in the bombing of Libya, and I think of a counterexample here, that was not US led. Okay? That was the French and the British who really pushed for that. And uh, I think it was Obama said, uh, we led from behind. <laughs> in other words, you know, the Brits and the French wanted to do it, so we said, okay. Okay, um, so that, that was an example of NATO getting involved in something um, not at the behest of the United States. Um, so it's, it's not always, um, it's not always the U.S. leading the way. Okay, uh, there's a few related questions here. Um, Claire asks uh, whether, uh, Claire Adamson asks whether um, Western states could uh, create a, another security group. Uh, let me just insert here, uh, it's been uh, proposed on occasion that the OSCE uh, be a substitute, you know, either an OSCE or an OSCE with guns or an OSCE with better control uh, could replace NATO. Uh, the, the distinction, of course, being that both the OSCE and the UN itself um, have uh, certain requirements for consensus or, uh, in the case of the UN, uh, UN Security Council decision, which would include, which include both US and Russia, if we're looking at that split. Uh, but her question continues, have, haven't you proved that um, NATO leads to um, Let's um, I'm trying to reread her sentence. Problematic world affairs. Can the UN take this opportunity to invite NATO to join the UN and, with UN rules? In other words, uh, what is it about NATO that is distinct from the UN, and could it be merged in some way? No, no. I mean, um, of course, um, states ultimately have the power to um, ignore international law if they so choose. Okay, but there is no way of um, forcibly subordinating NATO or any other institution to the United Nations. If, if states decide to come together in such a way to, to act contrary to um, the will of the United Nations or just simply without the consent, stated consent of the United Nations, there's absolutely nothing you can do to stop it, um, particularly if those states are powerful. Right? And... Um, the most powerful states in the world militarily are not going to subject themselves to external authority. Um, I, so I, I, you know, although you might say that's nice in a, in a theoretical sense, I don't see it as actually um, something that NATO members would ever accept. Um, so here's two questions uh, on this theme as well. Um, uh, Lawrence Cumming uh, notes that it seems that one of the strongest arguments against continued NATO membership is that it prevents uh, us, Canada, from making decisions we need to make. In other words, the influence of NATO is so powerful. Um, an ex example he gives is the uh, signing the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, this point is made by uh, Richard Denton as well. Um, he notes that in Western Can uh, uh, countries, including Canada, 70 80% of the population uh, are are in support of signing that treaty, um, but their governments aren't following this. Uh, what does this say about Western democracy? And um, as another person asks, what can Canada do about this within NATO uh, in terms of refusal uh, or um, standing back from the consensus, breaking the consensus within NATO? Um, I, I two points about that. I mean, the first. Um, Membership in any organization ties your hands in some way. I mean, that's, that's you know, um, that's a quid pro quo. You, 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 you get some benefits from the organization, and in return, you, you 
you limit yourself in certain ways. Um, so, so the issue would then be whether the the um, so obviously NATO membership is going to restrict Canada's um, freedom of um, movement in certain respects. That's inevitable. Um, ultimately, though, um, you know, then you have to just simply measure. Well, is it is it worth? Are we getting something else from it which um, compensates for that? Um, the second point, though, would be um, no, I've forgotten the second point. Um, yeah, it's a matter of political will, right? I mean, it, it's NATO membership doesn't it ties your hands, but only in a political sense, only in the sense that you you um, you don't want to have a big argument in the meeting with the other guys, right? So, so um, to make life easier for yourself, you you go along. Okay, and you, you really don't want the American ambassador shouting at you and, 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 and all the rest of it, right? So, um, but that doesn't mean you can't break ranks if you want, if you really want to. There's, there's nothing in NATO membership that says, you know, Canada can't sign this treaty if it wants to, right? Um, it can if it has the political will. And we've seen in the past that, you know, Canadian governments have. Uh, on occasion, um, displayed the political will to pursue policies which are contrary to uh, the desire of, of certain NATO allies, including the United States. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, uh, the invasion of Iraq would be a classic example of this. Um, ballistic missile defense might would be another one, and, and various other ones, right? So, so you, you don't have to go along all the time. It's a question of whether um, there's the political will to do so. Um, and um, the issue I see with Canadian governments say is that um, there has been something of an ideological shift uh, since the Chrétien government days, which means that political will just isn't there because our government, it's, it's not that our governments want to do these things but feel constrained by NATO. They actually don't believe in doing these things. Right. I mean, so, um, I, I don't think that, you know, the, the, um, the Trudeau government, um, particularly under the instance of Christian Freeland, who, who is quite a hawk in many ways, I, I do not get a sense that you know that, that they are interested in a different policy separate from that of the United States, right? And the Harper government, of course, like equally so. Okay, um, so the real problem, therefore, is is one of domestic politics and the, of the prevailing um, political ideology within our country. Uh, which produces a lack of political will, rather than 100% to do with, with um, NATO membership. Because even, even if um, even if we were in NATO, uh, we probably might still be going along with a lot of these things. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm going to jump to a question from Roy here. Um, does the very existence of NATO make a nuclear confrontation, nuclear weapon confrontation, more likely or less uh, uh, my, my my corollary or my addition to that is does does NATO make the world safer or less safe um, well here, here we're back to the theory I was talking about at the beginning uh, we're, we're involved in counterfactual so it's really um, kind of impossible to tell um, I, I think when I look at NATO's relationship with Russia, I think we're in, in a classic um, security dilemma, as international relations specialists would call it, where you know each side takes uh, measures for its own defense, which are interpreted as potentially hostile by the other side, which then takes further acts for its defense, and you end up in a, in a, in a, uh, in a spiral of, of, of rising tension, right? Um, which can only be solved by someone um, Getting, getting off the ladder of escalation at some point. Um, I personally think that um, nuclear war is extremely, extremely unlikely. You know, when, when I was young, um, people were really worried about this. So, so back, in, back in the 80s, you know, when you had these films like The Day After and so on, um, people were really worried about nuclear war. Um, not many um, people worry about it now. But um, there was a period earlier this year, around April, when um, there was some rising tensions between Ukraine and Russia. Um, and I, I, I do have some concerns that if NATO, um, this, was, this was framed in the Western press as being like, Russia's about to attack Ukraine. Um, in reality, what was going on was that um, 
there had been a buildup of Ukrainian forces on the line of confrontation in Donbass. Um, the Russians were concerned about a U massive Ukrainian uh, offensive into Donbass against the rebel forces there. And essentially what they were doing was um, threatening retaliation, right? And, and, and sending a signal to Ukraine, like, if, if, you, if you attack, we'll counterattack and destroy you. Now, this is, this is quite worrying because I, I could see something like that potentially happening. And if, 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 if NATO states, either through NATO or just individually, were to, to egg the Ukrainians on into doing something stupid, then we could see a, a, a Russian retaliation, um, which could lead to something very, very nasty. Um, uh, particularly if then some NATO members, like the Poles, decide to shove in their troops or something, right? Um, but that's less to do with NATO and more to do with um, geopolitics generally. Um, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't say NATO... It's not NATO per se, which is you know, making war more likely. I think it's the um, competing um, geographical interests of the collective West uh, and the Russian Federation, um, which um, are leading to potential conflict. And of course, if, if NATO was to try and expand into, in, into the Pacific, then, then we're in a whole different ball game. Right, um, and at that point, maybe that I, I, I fear that might make a general war more likely. Although I think it remains very, still very unlikely, because the major states understand that it's you know they they, they um, you don't fight a weapon, country of nuclear weapons. You know, so so why did NATO invade Iraq and not North Korea? Well, precisely because North Korea did have weapons of mass destruction, right? <laughs> because you, you you know no no one in their right mind actually attacks someone who has nuclear weapons right so 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 um i think we need to be uh, yeah there, there, there are some there are some worrying moments um but i'm not personally desperately afraid of nuclear war I, i'm more afraid of some lower level thing uh, well, we're still on the um, nuclear weapons um, subject. Uh, a question from, from Doug Roach. Um, are you aware of an uh, anti-nuclear weapons movement building up among some of the leading NATO members that Canada might join? I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of much of a peace movement generally. I would say, um, let alone specific um, anti um, anti nuclear weapons. It, it, I mean, it was a huge thing when I was younger, of course, back in the eighties. Um, but um, you know, CND and so on pretty much collapsed, and, and nothing really has taken its place. And indeed, the, the anti war movement generally is extremely weak. Um, it's it's highly fragmented. Different parts of it, I think. Don't like each other so i mean there's the traditional sort of left-wing anti um anti-war movement which has collapsed in large point because many liberals have moved towards liberal interventionism and uh, bombing making the world safe for human rights by bombing it um so there's been you know a a, a, a shift in that direction there is a um kind of intellectually and um deep and, 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 and um, coherent anti-war movement on the right, you know, which is associated with um, people like antiwar.com and, and, and now the Quincy Institute in the United States, um, led by Andrew Basevich. So these would be some more traditional realists. Um, but they don't coalesce. You know, um, I don't think you see the traditional left anti-war movement who sort of hates NATO as, you know, a source of all evil, um, going to meetings at the Quincy Institute, right? Um, or talking to Ron Paul Institute or whatever, right? So, so, so um, you know, there's fragmented bits out there, but on the whole, I, 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 I don't see very much anywhere, to be honest. A question from uh, Claire Adamson. Um... Uh, and I'll generalize it. Uh, is there a case for um, the International Court of Justice uh, pursuing uh, 
NATO or NATO members. Um, she asked NATO as a group, would, and I'm, I'm not sure that whether that would be something that the ICJ would handle. It, it, it deals with uh, nation states, I believe. But uh, would the ICJ be able to pursue nation states in the case of a NATO aggression? Um, yeah, I mean, the ICJ um, deals with, with states only, right? So it doesn't deal with international institutions or with individuals. So it will, it will accept um, cases involving states who, who have accepted the jurisdiction of um, the ICJ and have not um, issued some sort of declaration of exception for particular cases. Um, aggression per se is not the ICJ. It, it, it is um, now um, falls under the um, purview of the International Criminal Court. For, that would be for individuals, so not for states. Well, no, for the, well, for the act, for the, for, yeah, but so so for the act of um, the crime of the crime of aggression, right? So, could you do? Um, could you institute a suit for the crime of aggression in the International Court of Justice? I don't know, to be honest. Um, we do now have through the ICC an officially recognised definition of aggression. So therefore, theoretically, maybe um, that's one for us, someone who has a much more detailed, you know, I have a reasonable understanding of international law on this, but not, not sufficiently detailed to be able to answer that question. But it would, have to be a, it would have to be a state instituting a suit against another state, right? It, it couldn't be you or me instituting um, a claim against another state in the ICJ because we do not have jurisdiction. We do not have um, a right to bring a suit to the IC to the International Court of Justice. In the case of the ICC, so where are those world federalists when you need them? In the case of the ICC, uh, the prosecutor could bring a case against an individual, let's say a leader of one of the NATO member states. Uh, the Security Council could bring it, or a state that is a member of the uh, the ICC that was aggressed against could bring a case uh, against an individual leader. So, I mean, NATO would be a grouping of individual leaders and which one of those or all of them would be brought to the ICC. That would be a, that would be a complex case, I would think. Of course, you couldn't do it against the Americans because the Americans have not recognized jurisdiction of the ICC. So they've, they've exempted themselves from, from that. Right. Okay, um, back to the questions. Uh, how do you foresee, this is from uh, Tarek Abusali, how can you uh, foresee the alliance uh, and its future challenges and opportunities, including uh, with respect to Russia, uh, rise of China, new technologies, partnerships? General question. Um, you may want to focus on just some of those elements. Well, I mean, NATO seeks to, um, like any institution, it, it, um, um, it seeks its own perpetuation and, and um, sources of funding uh, and therefore will, of course, leap on any and all um, forms of supposed new threat to um, evolve, right? So you now see NATO having setting up like Centre to counter disinformation. Um, and so on and so forth, right? So, so NATO um, moves into all these new areas wherever and whenever they, they pop up. Um, and these will, of course, be used to, to continue to, um, um, to just justify what, it, what it's doing. Um, but I, I want to make very easy predictions on this because, you know, things keep changing. Like 20 years ago, it was all... It's not about major war. It's not about defending Europe. It's about um, international peace building and, and then it, it, ethnic cleansing. And then it became anti-terrorism. And now it's back to defending Europe against the Russians again, right? So um, um, what it will be 10, 20 years from now, I'm not sure, but I'm sure they'll come up with something. Uh, another question from Manfred. Um, um, I'm going to paraphrase him slightly. Um, are we uh, ever at risk of downplaying many of the most dangerous and aggressive aspects of NATO activities, including its pervasive support of 
greater military spending and widespread support for ethnic extremists in many states that it has chosen to define as our enemies of the yes and them problem. Well, um, I mean, one, I mean, I'd say one negative thing I think about NATO is that it does encourage higher military expenditure because it, it it's, um, the thing about a club, right, is, is you want to, you want to be able to turn up to the meeting club and people just like you, right? Um, it, it, it's, it, it's about, um, there's a degree of socialization which goes on, right? Um, whereby um, people who meet the expectations of a club are treated well, even if it's not, not in, in, in a general political sense, but just at the meeting, right? You turn up to the NATO meeting and no one really speaks to you because, you know, you haven't spent enough on defense and you're being kind of ostracized or whatever, right? And you don't like it, right? So to be accepted, you comply with the expectations and the expectation, of course, is always, is, is very much to, to um, contribute more, right? So the socialization aspect of NATO encourages high, high levels of defense spending. Uh, I think much higher than is actually necessary for the reasons um, for actual needs of defense. Right? No one's gonna, actually gonna attack Europe, right? I mean, the idea that, you know, um, Spain needs to spend a lot of money on defense is, is kind of weird because like, who's going to attack Spain? Like, militarily, if you think about it. And the answer, of course, is nobody. Right? Um, it could get rid of its army and no, no, one would, no one would invade Spain. We could get rid of our army. No one would invade Canada. Right? Um, so um, this encourages a lot of, I think, waste, waste of resources which could be much better spent on, on, on other things. Um, my, my old friend, Frank Ledridge, who was a British officer I, I quoted, who um, uh, was in uh, uh, Afghanistan, he wrote a book about the cost of the British um, operation in Afghanistan. And when he said what, what Britain could have spent the money on if it hadn't spent the money on fighting a pointless war in Afghanistan. And it was things like, you know, you could have run the entire NHS for 10 years or something, right? Or, it wasn't that. I think it's, you could have hired every nurse in the NHS for 10 years, or uh, you could have completely um, got rid of all tuition fees for university for the next 20 years. Things like this, right? You could have built 50 new hospitals, so on, right? And then you ask, well, which is a better use of the expenditure? You know, 10,000 new nurses, 50 new hospitals, or war in Afghanistan? And I think the answer to me is pretty, pretty, pretty obvious, right? So um, NATO, um, the socialization process, I mentioned about NATO, I think does have a negative effect in inducing us to spend money on things we sh really should not be spending money on. Um, and of course also, because then we end up with a huge surplus of military power beyond what we actually need, we are tempted to use it because um, to, to quote Madeleine Albright, you know, um, what's the point of having this wonderful army you talk about if you never use it, right? Um, so, um, you know, there, there are some, there are, yeah, there are some very definite, um, negatives as, as for support of uh, unsavory people, um, that's not really some NATO per se, but that, that's, um, that's done by individual NATO, NATO members, um, independently of NATO, um, rather than actually through NATO itself. I'm back on um, Afghanistan, a uh, question from Targ. Um, do you anticipate uh, a intervention, let's say a return by NATO uh, into Afghanistan with the Taliban on the advance? Um, let me add to that. Uh, is there any condition where a return of NATO would be um, highly expected, let's say, uh, um, is there some limit uh, to atrocity that would cause um, uh, members of NATO to do something, or would this possibly come through the UN with some uh, responsive protection? Extraordinarily high level of atrocity for to persuade um, political leaders in the West, but it was worth going back. Um, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, but I, uh, um, I would suspect more likely than you, if I, I don't personally don't expect to see 
foreign powers getting involved again because they've, you know, um, people don't, people know it doesn't work. Um, and no one really wants to get involved again. Um, if, however, you know, something so appalling happened that people felt something must be done, um, at that point, there would probably be, um, if, it's, if it was that terrible, you, you could, you, you know, the United, I don't see why the Russians or the Chinese would object to it. Right? So it could be a, uh, because it's not in the Russians' interest or the Chinese' interest to have chaos on their borders, right? So at that point, the likelihood would be that it would be a UN-sanctioned um, um, event, not, not a NATO event. That, that would be my feeling. I don't, I don't, I don't predict it happening, but if it were to happen, the things would be so unbelievably awful that everyone felt something must be done, even though they don't really want to. Um, at that point, you you would probably have a sanction for it. Although the Afghanistan uh, intervention from NATO was was a twist on the UN authorization, it was a UN authorized in the second half of it anyway. Yeah. Uh, that's where NATO filled the gap. So if the UN were to authorize some kind of action in Afghanistan now, it it it, it would it be NATO would be somebody else. You know. The, yeah, I mean the Russian Chinese probably would not. Offer Authorize NATO. I think this time around, right. they would. I mean, the Russians would not authorize NATO to do anything anymore. That's how, like, suspicions have sunk since, you know, the year thousands. Very good. I have uh, one question from John Foster. This is the last question, and I have a, a follow up question uh, after this. Uh, John asks, "Do you uh, how do you see the two percent of GDP target for NATO's military spending, and uh, why two percent?" It's a good question. Two percent is a completely arbitrary manner picked out of a, plucked out of the air because it's slightly higher than what people were spending. So you want to push them up. But um, there's um, very, one very good article I read by I forgot his name now. Um, books of the Independent Institute in America who, who wrote this article about this. We said, um, no, there's no logic linking defense expenditure to GDP ever. GDP is a, um, a because GDP is a measurement of how much you produce every year from nuclear weapons to hamburgers, right? So if you produce more hamburgers next year, if you, eat more, if you eat more hamburgers, your GDP goes up, okay? Now, if you've linked defense spending to GDP, you've eaten more hamburgers, so your, your GDP's gone up, so you therefore must spend more on defense. Why should you spend more on defense? Because you've eaten more hamburgers, <laughs> right? It, it, it's, it's completely illogical. Defense spending should be related to defense needs. Okay, so, so you, you, you go for a process where you determine what your interests are, what the threats to those interests are, and what strategy you're going to develop to, to combat that interest. And then from that, you can build up an idea of what force structure you need. And from then, you get an idea of how much money you need to spend. Yeah? And that could be 5% of GDP. It could be 1% of GDP. And for one state in NATO, it could be... Nothing in another state in NATO, it could be 10% in GDP. Okay. But none of it has got the slightest bit to do with GDP. Okay. So linking linking defense spending center to GDP is just bad defense planning. It doesn't make any sense within the logic of a rational defense planning model. Okay. And it's not a way any defense planner should be planning defense policy. That's my view on that. Thanks. Um, my my question, final question here. Um, we, we were talking about political will at the very beginning, uh, political will of NATO members to uh, speak up. In your view, um, what is a, a more likely uh, scenario um, given NATO's um, problematic elements? Let's say, let's call them that. Uh, is Canada uh, more likely to uh, step out of NATO? Um, or is Canada more likely to push within NATO for change, or is neither of those two scenarios likely? Um, I think it's Joel Sokolsky uh, at RMC who once wrote a piece saying that the, the optimum strategy for Canada is to do the absolute minimum required to get a seat at the table. <laughs> and then just to sort of, you know, just do that minimum and then shut up. Okay? Um, and that is generally what Canadian governments have done. 
Okay, so you know we we do we, we do enough so that we can turn up to the meeting and everyone doesn't shout at us. But yeah, we don't really press to change anything. We don't get out because you know we want to we want to be in the club. Um, so that is um, that is you know the most likely scenario to follow in the future because that has been traditionally what we have done. Now um, the current government has been a little bit more belligerent um in some respects and it's promised like massive increase in defense expenditure and it's taken the lead in the lima group against venezuela and so on in, in that sense it's gone um i must say above and beyond what um <laughs> uh would normally be expected from canadian governments but I, I would expect it to settle back down again to a more just sort of going along with the flow contributing enough but not too much um type 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 thing don't rock the boat but don't overdo it either you know uh, and then you know we 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 part of least resistance essentially great with that optimistic note uh thanks um professor robinson uh, very much for your uh, presentation here and your answering these questions uh, i'll pass it over to roy well let me thank my uh, add my thanks to uh, those of uh, robin to uh Professor uh, Robinson, um, I, I have to say that when you said that there were some worrying moments uh, in the Ukraine, uh, I think there are a number of worrying moments all over the world, and they're not necessarily decreasing in their frequency. And I'd also add that um, we're, we've just passed the 46th anniversary of Hiroshima, and there seemed to be no end in sight of nuclear weapons. Uh, procurement. In fact, uh, the Americans are talking about a $1 trillion plus modernization program over the next uh, decade or so. And of course, you could fund a lot of nurses and a lot of uh, COVID-19 vaccines uh, in most of the world where no such vaccines have been deployed for those kinds of sums of money. So, so I think there's a lot of work to be done uh, on the nuclear disarmament front uh, and uh, that work, uh, uh, notwithstanding the probability of them being deployed or not uh, uh, in, in an actual war, uh, still lies ahead of us. So having said that, um, I, I just wanted to uh, say one more thing. The um, Group of 78 is going to uh, mark its uh, 40th anniversary this year. Uh, partly by uh, convening its annual policy conference uh, at the end of September on the subject of adaptation, building resilience uh, in the climate emergency. So I strongly urge all those who participated in uh, this webinar to think about and attend our uh, forthcoming conference because adaptation is an issue which, as the recent IPCC report, uh, has uh, really emphasized is uh, a challenge that we need to rise to, uh, as well as the challenge of mitigation, i.e. Uh, cutting off the, the, the fossil fuels that are fueling uh, climate change through CO2 emissions. Anyway, um, thanks to all for participating, and particularly um, for those who, who posed questions. And uh, thank you to Sarah Bowles, who, as ever, has been uh, uh, in our control room behind the scenes and help to organize this, this event. And I hope we can repeat this uh, sometime in the future. Thank you and take care.